one more part of The Last Supper I need to include before he begins his massively long speech in John, and that is him telling him to be armed. And it's only in Luke. It's not in Matthew, Mark, or John. And he said to them, Without purse and script and shoes lacked you anything. And they said nothing. Then said he to them, But now he that has a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. I want to speak on this, but first let me finish writing out what else he said on the subject. This is their response to what he said. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. About this, Jesus just said, be armed, have a sword. This seems really strange compared to everything else he's been saying. He said, love your enemies. Forgive 70 times 7. James and John, when they asked Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven to kill these Samaritans because Jesus had set his face to go to Jerusalem instead of worshiping on Mount Gerizim where they do, Jesus said, no, you don't know what spirit you're of. There have been many other situations where Jesus could have responded in a more violent manner, but he always opted for peace. So why is he saying, be armed? Why is he saying, have a sword? I think the answer is in their response and his final exclamation. They say, here, we've got two. And he says, that's fine, that's enough. Also later, when they actually get to the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is arrested, Peter takes out his sword, probably one of them with the sword was Peter, because Peter grabs the sword and he goes to kill someone but he only gets an ear. Maybe the guy ducked, he was gonna go for their head and he only got an ear. Jesus heals that ear and he says, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. So have a sword, two among all 13 of them, while well, Judas had left, so all 12 of them is enough. And even when Jesus himself, the son of God is being arrested, that's not the right time to use a sword to defend someone else. What exactly is the point of having a sword then? If you're not going to use it to defend Jesus when he's going down the cross, which was his plan, and if you're not going to take over Jerusalem and free yourselves from an oppressive government, why have a sword? I think it's in the extremely, extremely rare occasion that loving your neighbor, even with keeping in mind loving your enemy, when loving your neighbor would require the use of deadly force because it would be appropriate in a response to what they started. If, for example, you happen to be present and in comes a shooter, a mass shooter, and they are just intent on killing people, and they, they may have already started kill, 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 murder, for whatever reason, I don't think that the love for your enemy would overrule your love for your neighbor to just say, yes, continue, or I'll just go hide, so just go ahead. I don't think so. There is a time to intervene, 
That would be mercy, to protect those who are in need. Jesus called us to care for the orphans and the widows. If you're going to care for them because they're hungry, then it makes sense that you would care for them if they're about to be slaughtered. This has to be rare. The times that you would actually use deadly force as an appropriate response ought to be extremely rare. And if anyone feels called to be prepared, then they would need to be also prepared to face the repercussions of going to jail, of explaining their response before a jury and before the entire world and before God that your act was appropriate and it was loving and it was the last case scenario along with the fact that it's going to probably cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend yourself in court and you have to live with that stigma for the rest of your life that you have killed someone you would have to be massively prepared financially emotionally and spiritually to ever even consider using deadly force ever and yet Jesus said be armed so there may be a rare scenario where it could be right it would be rare but it could happen I would say the way to obey what Jesus said is if you are one of the few because again they had two swords among 12 of them and he said it's enough if you're one of the few in the entire world able to remain calm under pressure and to be merciful to those who are around you and even loving to the bad guy to the point that you're not just gonna draw at first opportunity and you're able to live with the repercussions and you're prepared for the repercussions the mental emotional spiritual financial everything that could happen then yes I think that it would be appropriate to be armed with a firearm today which would be equivalent to a sword in those days but again it's got to be rare that you would ever use a weapon it would have to be extremely rare and it's not to overthrow a government clearly two weapons among 12 was enough you're not going to defend even Jesus going to the cross because that was right sometimes it is right to die for your cause I don't think it's right to die for every cause, and if someone wants to just kill you for any cause, to just say, okay, yes. It would be right to die for Jesus' name's sake, as he said earlier. Yes, if you're going to die for the gospel's sake, great. That is a martyr, you are a witness, and you will be rewarded in heaven for it. This life is not the only one. Deadly force is not used to defend your life because... Your life is the most precious thing to you. No, this life is not the only one. Everything we do here echoes in eternity, and you need to be prepared to answer for it and to live out the repercussions of it for eternity. Some things are worth dying for, and some things are worth killing for. But it has to be appropriate. It has to be right before God and you have to be prepared to live with yourself and the family of whoever it was that you have defended against for the rest of your life and for eternity. It should be extremely rare. You know, this is actually a far better place to have the ending statement from Mark that they all drank of it, meaning the cup Jesus gave for communion. Because just before this, he's still giving his statement about what the cup means. It began with him taking the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, take this, divide it among yourselves, drink you all of it. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And instead of having here that they drank, and then having Jesus' last statement about how he will not drink, I think it makes more sense to have all of Jesus' statements. But verily I say to you, I will not drink hereafter of the fruit of the vine until that day shall come when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God my Father. And now that they all drink. I know it's out of order in Mark. 
But in Mark, it doesn't have the statement from Matthew, drink all of it. So that statement, drink all of it, would not make any sense to come after it says, they drank. So since I am going to have drink you all of it from Matthew, and that's included in this entire response from Matthew and Mark, it would probably make sense to have the entire response before they all drank. So Mark missing this statement from Matthew, drink you all of it, is really the deciding factor. Jesus telling them to drink has to come first before they drank. So I'll have they all drank here now. And then move on.